Chapter 13 of The Lion of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark. A Story of Venice in the 14th Century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 13 The Pirate's Raid. As soon as it was daylight next morning, Francis was up and at work. His experiments of the evening before were at once confirmed. Three or four hours' work would enable him to free his wrists, but he could make no impression on the rivets at his ankles. After a few trials he gave this up as hopeless, for he was afraid if he continued he would blunt the edge of the dagger. For an hour he sat still, thinking, and at last an idea occurred to him iron could be ground by rubbing it upon stone and if he could not cut off the burr of the rivet with the dagger he might perhaps be able to wear it down by rubbing it with a stone he at once turned to the walls of his cell these were not built of the unbaked clay so largely used for houses of the poorer class in northern egypt but had evidently been constructed either as a prison or more probably as a strong room where some merchant kept valuable goods it was therefore constructed of blocks of hard stone it seemed to francis that this was sandstone and to test its quality he sat down in the corner where the guard had the night before placed his supply of food and water first he moistened a portion of the wall then he took up a link of his chain and rubbed for some time against it at last to his satisfaction a bright patch showed that the stone was capable of wearing away iron but in vain did he try to twist his legs so as to rub the rivet against the wall and he gave up the attempt as impossible it was clear then that he must have a bit of the stone to rub with he at once began to dig with the dagger in the earth at the foot of the wall to see if he could find any such pieces for a long time he came across no chips even of the smallest size as he worked he was most careful to stamp down the earth which he had moved scattering over it the sand of which there was an abundance in the corners of the room to obliterate all traces of his work when breakfast time approached he ceased for a while but after the meal had been taken he recommenced the task he met with little success till he reached the door but here he was more fortunate a short distance below the surface were a number of pieces of stone of various sizes which he had no doubt had been cut from the blocks to allow for the fixing of the lintel and door post he chose half a dozen pieces of the handiest sizes each having a flat surface then replacing the earth carefully he took one of the pieces in his hand and moistening it with water set to work he made little progress still the stone did wear the iron and he felt sure that by perseverance he should succeed in wearing off the burrs all day he worked without intermission holding a rag wrapped round the stone to deaden the sound he worked till his fingers ached so that he could no longer hold it then rested for an hour or two and resumed his work when his guard brought his dinner he asked him when the galley was to sail again it was to have gone to-day the man said but the captain has been laid up with fever he has a leech from tunis attending him and weak as he is he is so bent on going that he would have had himself carried on board the ship had not the leech said that in that case he would not answer for his life as in the state his blood is in his wounds would assuredly mortify did he not remain perfectly quiet so he has agreed to delay for three days Francis was unable to work with the stone at night, for in the stillness the sound might be heard, but for some hours he hacked away with the dagger at the rivets on his manacles. The next morning he was at work as soon as the chirrup of the cicadas began, as these he knew would completely deaden any sound he might make. By night-time the rivet ends on the irons round his ankles were worn so thin that he felt sure that another hour's work would bring them level with the iron and before he went to sleep the rivets on the wrist were in the same condition he learned from his guard next morning that the captain was better 
that he was to be taken on board in the cool of the evening and that the vessel would start as soon as the breeze sprang up in the morning in the afternoon his two guards entered and bade him follow them he was conducted to the principal house in the village and into a room where ruggiero mochenigo was lying on a couch i have sent for you ruggiero said to tell you that i have not forgotten you my vengeance has been delayed from no fault of mine but it will be all the sweeter when it comes i am going to fetch polani's daughters i have heard that since you thrust yourself between me and them you have been a familiar in the house that polani treats you as a member of the family and that you are in high favor with his daughters i have kept myself informed of what happened in venice and i have noted each of these things down in the account of what i owe you i am going to fetch polani's daughters here and to make maria my wife and then i will show her how i treat those who cross my path it will be a lesson to her as well as for you you shall wish yourself dead a thousand times before death comes to you i always knew that you were a villain ruggiero mochenigo francis said quietly although i hardly thought that a man who had once the honor of being a noble of venice would sink to become a pirate and renegade you may carry maria polani off but you will never succeed through her in obtaining a portion of her father's fortune for i know that the first moment her hands are free she will stab herself to the heart rather than remain in the power of such a wretch ruggiero snatched up a dagger from a table by his couch as francis was speaking but dropped it again fool he said am i not going to carry off the two girls and do you not see that it will tame maria's spirit effectually when she knows that if she lays hands on herself she will but shift the honor of being my wife from herself to her sister as the laugh of anticipated triumph rang in francis's ears the latter in his fury made a spring forward to throw himself upon the villain but he had forgotten his chains and fell headlong on to the floor guards ruggiero shouted take this fellow away and i charge you watch over him securely and remember that your lives shall answer for his escape there is no need for threats signor filippo said you can rely on our vigilance though as far as i see if he had but a child to watch him he would be safe in that cell of his fettered as he is ruggiero waved his hand impatiently and the two men withdrew with their prisoner if it were not that i have not touched my share of the booty of our last trip filippo said as they left the house i would not serve him another day as it is as soon as the galley returns and we get our shares of the money and of the sum he has promised if this expedition of his is successful i will be off i have had enough of this it is bad enough to be consorting with moors without being abused and threatened as if one was a dog as soon as he was alone again francis set to work and by the afternoon the ends of the four rivets were worn down level with the iron and it needed but a pressure to make the rings spring open then he waited for the evening before freeing himself as by some chance he might again be visited and even if free before nightfall he could not leave the house filippo was later than usual in bringing him his meal and francis heard angry words passing between him and his comrade because he had not returned to relieve him sooner is everything ready for the start francis asked the man as he entered yes the crew are all on board the boat is to be on shore for the captain at nine o'clock and as there is a little breeze blowing i expect they will get up sail and start at once after a few minutes talk the man left and francis waited until it became almost dark then he inserted the dagger between the irons at the point of junction at the first wrench they flew apart and his left hand was free a few minutes more work and the chains lay on the ground taking them up he rattled them together loudly in a minute he heard the guard outside move and come to the door then the key was inserted in the lock and the door opened 
"'What on earth are you doing now?' Filippo asked as he entered. Francis was standing close to the door, so that as his guard entered, he had his back to him, and before the question was finished he sprang upon him, throwing him headlong to the ground with the shock, and before the astonished man could speak, he was kneeling upon him with the point of the dagger at his throat. "'If you make a sound or utter a cry,' he exclaimed, "'I will drive this dagger into your throat.' Filippo could feel the point of the dagger against his skin, and remained perfectly quiet. "'I do not want to kill you, Filippo. You have not been harsh to me, and I would spare your life if I could. Hold your hands back above your head, and put your wrists together that I may fasten them. Then I will let you get up.' Filippo held up his hands as requested, and Francis bound them tightly together with a strip of twisted cloth. He then allowed him to rise. Now, Filippo, I must gag you. Then I will fasten your hands to a bar well above your head, so that you can't get at the rope with your teeth. I will leave you here till your comrade comes in the morning. I would rather that you killed me at once, signor, the man said. Tommaso will be furious at your having made your escape, for he will certainly come in for a share of the fury of the captain. There are three or four of the crew remaining behind, and no doubt they will keep me locked up till the ship returns, and in that case the captain will be as good as his word. You had better kill me at once. But what am I to do, Filippo? I must ensure my own safety. If you will suggest any way by which I can do that, I will. I would swear any oath you like, signor, that I will not give the alarm. I will make straight across the island and get hold of a boat there, so as to be well away before your escape is known in the morning. Well, look here, Filippo. I believe you are sincere, and you shall take the oath you hold most sacred. You can accompany me, signor, if you will. Keep my hands tied till we are on the other side of the island and stab me if I give the alarm. I will not do that, Filippo. I will trust you altogether, but first take the oath you spoke of. Filippo swore a terrible oath, that he would abstain from giving the alarm, and would cross the island and make straight for the mainland. Francis at once cut the bonds. You will lose your share of the plunder, Filippo, and you will have to keep out of the way to avoid the captain's rage. Therefore I advise you, when you get to Tunis, to embark in the first ship that sails. If you come to Venice, ask for me, and I will make up to you for your loss of booty, and put you in the way of leading an honest life again. But before going, you must first change clothes with me. You can sell mine at Tunis for enough to buy you a dozen suits like yours, but you must divide with me what money you now have in your possession, for I cannot start penniless." I thank you for your kindness, the man said. You had it in your power with a thrust of the dagger to make yourself safe, and you abstained. Even were it not for my oath, I should be a treacherous dog indeed were I to betray you. I do not know what your plans are, signor, but I pray you to follow my example and get away from this place before daylight. The people here will all aid in the search for you, and as the island is not large, you will assuredly be discovered. It has for many years been a rendezvous of pirates, a place to which they bring their booty to sell to the traders who come over from the mainland. Thank you for your advice, Filippo, and be assured I shall be off the island before daybreak. But I have some work to do first, and cannot therefore accompany you. May all the saints bless you, Signor, and aid you to get safe away. Assuredly, if I live, I will ere long present myself to you at Venice, not for the money which you so generously promised me, but that I may, with your aid, earn an honest living among Christians. By this time the exchange of clothes was effected, the six ducats in Filippo's purse, the result of a little private plundering on one of the captured vessels, divided, and then they left the prison room, and Filippo locked the door after them. Is there any chance of Tommaso returning speedily? Francis asked. Because, if so, 
he might notice your absence and so give the alarm before the ship set sail in which case we should have the whole crew on our tracks i do not think that he will he will be likely to be drinking in the wine shop for an hour or two before he returns but i tell you what i will do senor i will resume my place here on guard until he has returned he will relieve me at midnight and in the darkness will not notice the change of clothes there will still be plenty of time for me to cross the island and get out of sight in the boat before the alarm is given which will not be until six o'clock when i ought to relieve him again as you say if the alarm were to be given before the vessel sails they might start at once to cut us off before we reach the mainland for they would make sure that we should try to escape in that direction that will be the best plan filippo and now good-bye francis walked down to the shore there were no boats lying there of a size he could launch unaided but presently he heard the sound of oars and a small fishing boat rowed by two men approached look here lads he said i want to be put on board the ship i ought to have been on board three hours ago but took too much wine and lay down for an hour or two and overslept myself do you think you can row quietly up alongside so that i can slip on board unnoticed if so i will give you a ducat for your trouble we can do that the fisherman said we have just come from the ship now and have sold them our catch of to-day there were half a dozen other boats lying beside her bargaining for their fish besides they are taking on board firewood and other stores that have been left till the last moment so jump in and we will soon get you there in a few minutes they approached the side of the ship i see you have got half a dozen fish left in your boat now francis said they are of no account one of the men said they are good enough for our eating but not such as they buy on board a ship where money is plentiful you are heartily welcome to them if you have a fancy for them thank you francis said i will take two or three of them if you can spare them i want to play a trick with a comrade as the fisherman said there were several boats lying near the vessel and the men were leaning over the sides bargaining for fish handing the fishermen their promised reward francis sprang up the ladder to the deck he was unnoticed for other men had gone down into the boats for fish mingling with the sailors he gradually made his way to the hatchway leading into the hold descended the ladder and stowed himself away among a quantity of casks some filled with wine and some with water at the farther end of the hold and as he lay there devoutly thanked god that his enterprise had been so far successful men came down from time to time with lanterns to stow away the lately arrived stores but none came near the place where francis was hidden the time seemed long before he heard the clank of the capstan and knew the vessel was being hove up to her anchors then after a while he heard the creaking of cordage and much trampling of feet on the deck above and knew that she was under way then he made himself as comfortable as he could in his cramped position and went off to sleep when he woke in the morning the light was streaming down the hatch which was only closed in rough weather as it was necessary frequently to go down into it for water and stores francis had brought the fish with him as a means of subsistence during the voyage in case he should be unable to obtain provisions but for this there was no occasion as there was an abundance of fruit hanging from the beams while piles of bread were stowed in a partition at one end of the hold during the day however he did not venture to move and was heartily glad when it again became dark and he could venture to get out and stretch himself he appropriated a loaf and some bunches of grapes took a long drink from a pail placed under the tap of a water butt and made his way back to his corner after a hearty meal he went out again for another drink and then turned in to sleep so passed six days by the rush of water against the outside planks he could always judge whether the vessel was making brisk way or whether she was lying becalmed once or twice after nightfall he ventured up on deck feeling certain that in the darkness there was no fear of his being detected from conversation he overheard on the seventh evening 
he learned that Corfu had been sighted that day. For some hours, the vessel's sails had been lowered, and she had remained motionless, but she was now again making for the land, and in the course of another two hours a landing was to be made. The boats had all been got in readiness, and the men were to muster fully armed, although, as they understood, the carrying off of two girls was their special object, it was intended that they should gather as much plunder as could be obtained. The island was rich, for many wealthy Venetians had residences there. Therefore, with the exception of a few men left on board to take care of the galley, the whole were to land. A picked boat's crew were to accompany the captain, who was now completely convalescent. The rest were to divide in bands and scatter over the country, pillaging as they went, and setting fire to the houses. It was considered that such consternation would be caused that nothing like resistance could be offered for some time, and by daybreak all hands were to gather at the landing place. How far this spot was from the town Francis had no means of learning. There was a store of spare arms in the hold, and Francis, furnishing himself with a sword and large dagger, waited until he heard a great movement overhead, and then went upon deck and joined a gang of men employed in lowering one of the boats. The boat was a large one, rowing sixteen oars and carrying some twenty men seated in the stern. Here Francis took his place with the others. The boat pushed off and waited until four others were launched and filled. Then the order was given, and the boats rowed in a body towards the shore. The men landed and formed under their respective officers, one man remaining in each boat to keep it afloat. Francis leaped ashore, and while the men were forming up, found no difficulty in slipping away unnoticed. As he did not know where the path was and was afraid of making a noise, he lay down among the rocks until he heard the word of command to start given. Then he cautiously crept out, and, keeping far enough in the rear to be unseen, followed the sound of their footsteps. By the short time which had elapsed between the landing and the start, he had no doubt they were guided by some persons perfectly acquainted with the locality, probably by some natives of the island among the mixed crew. Francis had, during his voyage, thought over the course he should pursue on landing, and saw that, ignorant as he was of the country, his only hope was in obtaining a guide who would conduct him to Polani's villa before the arrival of Mucinigo and his band. The fact that the crew were divided into five parties, which were to proceed in different directions, and that he did not know which of them was commanded by the captain, added to the difficulty. Had they kept together, he might, after seeing the direction in which they were going, make a detour and get ahead of them but he might now follow a party going in an entirely wrong direction, and before he could obtain a guide, Mochenigo's band might have gone so far that they could not be overtaken before they reached the villa. There was nothing to do but to get ahead of all the parties, in the hope of coming upon a habitation before going far. As soon, therefore, as the last band had disappeared, he started at a run. The country was open, with few walls or fences, therefore on leaving the road he was able to run rapidly forwards and in a few minutes knew that he must be ahead of the pirates then he again changed his course so as to strike the road he had left after running for about a mile he saw a light ahead of him and soon arrived at a cottage he knocked at the door and then entered the occupants of the room a man and woman a lad and several children rose to their feet at the sudden entrance of the stranger. "'Good people,' Francis said, "'I have just landed from a ship, and am the bearer of important messages to the Signoras Polani. I have lost my way, and it is necessary that I should go on without a moment's delay. Can you tell me how far the villa of Polani is distant?' "'It is about three miles from here,' the man said." I will give a ducat to your son if he will run on with me at once. The man looked doubtful. The apparel and general appearance of Francis were not prepossessing. He had been six days a prisoner in the hold without means of washing. See, 
he said, producing a ducat. Here is the money. I will give it you at once if you will order your son to go with me, and to hurry at the top of his speed. It's a bargain, the man said. Here, Rufo, start at once with the signor. Come along, signor, the boy said, and without another word to the parents, Francis followed him out, and both set off at a run along the road. Francis had said nothing about pirates to the peasants, for he knew that, did he do so, such alarm would be caused that they would think of nothing but flight, and he should not be able to obtain a guide. It was improbable that they would be molested. The pirates were bent upon pillaging the villas of the wealthy, and would not risk the raising of an alarm by entering cottages where there was no chance of plunder. After proceeding a few hundred yards, the lad struck off by a by-road at right angles to that which they had been following, and by the direction he took, Francis felt that he must at first have gone far out of his way, and that the party going direct to the villa must have had a considerable start. Still, he reckoned that as he was running at the rate of three feet to every one they would march, he might hope to arrive at the house well before them. Not a word was spoken as they ran along. The lad was wondering in his mind as to what could be the urgent business that could necessitate its being carried at such speed, while Francis felt that every breath was needed for the work he had to do. Only once or twice he spoke, to ask how much further it was to their destination. The last answer was cheering. A few hundred paces farther. There are the lights, signor. They have not gone to bed. This is the door. Francis knocked with the pummel of his sword, keeping up a loud, continuous knocking. A minute or two passed, and then a face appeared at the window above. Who is it that knocks so loudly at this time of night? It is Francisco Hammond. Open instantly. Danger threatens the signoras. Quick, for your life. The servant recognized the voice, and ran down without hesitation, and unbarred the fastening. But for a moment he thought he must have been mistaken, as Francis ran into the lighted hall. Where are the ladies? he asked. Lead me to them instantly. But, as he spoke, a door standing by was opened, and Signor Polani himself, with the two girls, appeared. They had been on the point of retiring to rest when the knocking began, and the merchant, with his drawn sword, was standing at the door when he recognized Francis's voice. They were about to utter an exclamation of pleasure at seeing him, and of astonishment, not only at his sudden arrival, but at his appearance, when Francis burst out, there is no time for a word. You must fly instantly. Ruggiero Mocenigo is close at my heels with a band of twenty pirates. The girls uttered a cry of alarm, and the merchant exclaimed, Can we not defend the house, Francisco? I have eight men here, and we can hold it till assistance comes. Ruggiero has a hundred, Francis said, and all can be brought up in a short time. You must fly. For God's sake, do not delay, signor. They may be here at any moment. Come, girls, Polani said. And you too, he went on, turning to the servants, whom the knocking had caused to assemble. Do you follow us. Resistance would only cost you your lives. Here, Maria, take my hand. Francisco, do you see to Julia. Close the door after the last of you and bolt it. It will give us a few minutes before they break in and discover that we have all gone. Which way are the scoundrels coming? Francis pointed in the direction from which he had come, and the whole party started at a fast pace in the other direction. They had not been gone five minutes, when a loud and sudden knocking broke on the silence of the night. It was a close thing indeed, Francisco, the merchant said, as they ran along close to each other. At present... I feel as if I was in a dream, but you shall tell us all presently. They were, by this time, outside the grounds of the villa, and some of the servants who knew the country now took the lead. In a few minutes the merchant slackened his pace. We are out of danger now, he said. They will not know in which direction to search for us, and if they scatter in pursuit we could make very short work of any that might come up with us. 
I do not know that you are out of danger, Francis said. A hundred men landed. Mochenigo, with twenty, took the line to your house, but the rest have scattered over the country in smaller bands, bent on murder and pillage. Therefore we had best keep on as fast as we can, until well beyond the circle they are likely to sweep, that is, unless the ladies are tired. Tired, Maria repeated. Why, Julia and I go for long walks every day, and could run for an hour if necessary. Then come on, my dears, the merchant said. I am burning to know what this all means, and I am sure you are equally curious, but nothing can be said till you are in safety. Accordingly, the party again broke into a run. A few minutes later, one of the servants, looking back, exclaimed, They have fired the house, signor. There are flames issuing from one of the lower windows. I expected that, the merchant said, without looking back. That scoundrel would, in any case, light it in his fury at finding that we have escaped, but he has probably done so now, in hopes that the light will enable him to discover us. It is well that we are so far ahead, for the blaze will light up the country for a long way round. There is a wood a little way ahead, signor, the servant said. Once through that we shall be hidden from sight, however great the light. Arrived at the wood, they again broke into a walk. A few hundred yards beyond the wood was some rising ground from which they could see far over the country. Let us stop here, the merchant said. We are safe now. We have placed two miles between ourselves and those villains. The villa was now a mass of flames. Exclamations of fury broke from the men's servants, while the women cried with anger at the sight of the destruction. Do not concern yourselves, the merchant said. The house can be rebuilt, and I will see that none of you are the poorer for the loss of your belongings. Now, girls, let us sit down here, and hear from Francisco how it is that he has once again been your savior. Before I begin, signor, tell me whether there are any ships of war in the port, and how far that is distant from us. It is not above six miles on the other side of the island. That is to say, we have been going towards it since we left the villa. See, he broke off, there are flames rising in three or four directions. The rest of those villains are at their work. But are there any war galleys in the port? Francis interrupted. Yes, three ships were sent here, on the report that a Moorish pirate had been cruising in these waters, and that several vessels were missing. When the story first came, I did not credit it. The captain of the ship, who brought the news, told me he had met you about halfway across, and had told you about the supposed pirate. A vessel arrived four days later, and brought letters from my agent, but he said no word about your boat having arrived. Then I became uneasy, and when later news came, and still no word of you, I felt sure that something must have befallen you, that possibly the report was true, and that you had fallen into the hands of the pirates. So I at once started, in one of the galleys which the council were dispatching, in answer to the request of the governor here. In that case, signor, there is not a moment to lose. The governor should be informed that the pirate is lying on the opposite coast, and that his crew have landed and are burning and pillaging. If orders are issued at once, the galleys could get round before morning, and so cut off the retreat of these miscreants. You are quite right, Polani said, rising at once. We will go on without a moment's delay. The girls can follow slowly under the escort of the servants. Oh, Papa, Maria exclaimed, you are not going to take Francisco away till we have heard his story. Can you not send forward the servants with a message to the governor? No, my dear, the governor will have gone to bed, and the servants might not be able to obtain admittance to him. I must go myself. It is for your sakes as well as for my own. We shall never feel a moment's safety as long as this villain is at large. Francisco's story will keep till tomorrow. As to your gratitude and mine, that needs no telling. He cannot but know what we are feeling at the thought of the almost miraculous escape you have had from falling into the hands of your persecutor. Now, come along, Francisco. 
one of you men who knows the road had better come with us do the rest of you all keep together two miles further girls as you know is a villa of carlo maffeni if you feel tired you had best stop and ask for shelter there there is no fear that the pirates will extend their ravages so far they will keep on the side of the island where they landed so as to be able to return with their booty before daybreak to the ship End of chapter 13 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 14 of The Lion of St. Mark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 14, The End of the Persecutor. Signor Polani was so well known that upon his arrival at the governor's house, the domestics, upon being aroused, did not hesitate to awaken the governor at once. The latter, as soon as he heard that the pirates had landed and were devastating the other side of the island, and that their ship was lying close in to the coast under the charge of a few sailors only at once dispatched a messenger to the commander of the galleys ordering them to arouse the crews and make ready to put out to sea instantly he added that he himself should follow his messenger on board in a few minutes and should accompany them he then issued orders that the bell should toll to summon the inhabitants to arms and directed an officer to take the command and to start with them at once across the island and to fall upon the pirates while engaged in their work of pillage they were to take a party with them with litters to carry polani's daughters to the town and an apartment was to be assigned to them in his palace until his return while he was issuing this order refreshments had been placed upon the table and he pressed Polani and his companions to partake of these before starting. Francis needed no second invitation. He had been too excited at the news he had heard on board the ship to think of eating, and he now remembered that it was a good many hours since he had taken his last meal. He was but a few minutes, however, in satisfying his hunger. By the time he had finished, the governor had seen that his orders had been carried out. Two hundred armed citizens had already mustered in companies, and were now on the point of setting out, burning with indignation at what they had heard of the depredations which the pirates had committed. After seeing his preparations complete, the governor, accompanied by Polani and Francis, made his way down to the port and was rowed out to the galleys. Here he found all on the alert. The sails were ready for hoisting, and the men were seated at the benches ready to aid with oars the light wind which was blowing the governor now informed the commander of the vessels the reason of the sudden orders for sailing the news was passed to the captains of the other two vessels and in a very few minutes the anchors were weighed and the vessels started on their way francis was closely questioned as to the spot at which the pirate vessel was lying but could only reply that beyond the fact that it was some four miles from polani's villa he had no idea of the locality but can you not describe to us the nature of the coast the commander said that i cannot francis replied for i was hidden away in the hold of the vessel and did not come on deck until after it was dark at which time the land abreast of us was only a dark mass signor polani has informed me the governor said that although your attire does not betoken it you are a dear friend of his but he has not yet informed me how it comes that you were upon this pirate ship he has been telling me as we came along polani replied and a strange story it is he was on his voyage hither in the naxos which as you doubtless remember was a little craft of mine which should have arrived here a month since as we supposed it was captured by the pirates the leader of whom is ruggiero mocenigo who as of course you know made his escape from the custody of the officers of the state they being overpowered by a party of paduans the sentence of banishment for life has been passed against him 
and until i heard from my friend here that he was captain of the pirate which has been seen off this island i knew not what had become of him those on board the naxos were taken prisoners and confined in the pirate's hold which they found already filled with captives taken from other ships the pirate at once sailed for africa where all the prisoners were sold as slaves to the moors my friend here alone excepted mochenigo having an old feud with him and a design to keep him in his hands learning that a raid was intended upon corfu with the special design of carrying off my daughters whom mochenigo had twice previously tried to abduct francisco managed to get on board the vessel and conceal himself in her hold in order that he might frustrate the design he managed in the dark to mingle with the landing party and then separating from them made his way on ahead and fortunately was able to obtain a guide to my house which he reached five minutes only before the arrival of the pirates there admirable indeed and we are all vastly indebted to him for had it not been for him we should not have known of the doings of these scoundrels until too late to cut off their retreat and once away in their ship again they might long have preyed upon our commerce before one of our cruisers happened to fall in with them as for ruggiero mochenigo he is a disgrace to the name of a venetian and it is sad to think that one of our most noble families should have to bear the brand of being connected with a man so base and villainous however i trust that his power of ill-doing has come to an end is the vessel a fast one signor i cannot say whether she sails fast francis replied but she certainly rows fast i trust that we shall catch her before she gets under way the commander of the galleys said our vessels are not made for rowing although we get out oars to help them along in calm weather what course do you propose to take the merchant asked when we approach the spot where she is likely to be lying i shall order the captains of the other two ships to lie off the coast a couple of miles distant and as far from each other so that they can cut her off as she makes out to sea we will follow the coastline keeping in as close as the water will permit and in this way we shall most likely come upon her if we should miss her i shall at the first dawn of morning join the others in the offing and keep watch till she appears from under the shadow of the land it was now three o'clock in the morning and an hour later the three vessels parted company and the galley with the governor and commander of the squadron rowed for the shore when they came close to the land the captain ordered the oars to be laid in the breeze is very light he said but it is favorable and will enable us to creep along the shore if we continue rowing those in charge of the ship may hear us coming and may cut their cables get up sail and make out from the land without our seeing them on a still night like this the sound of the sweeps can be heard a very long distance quietly the vessel made her way along the shore over the land the sky was red with the reflection of numerous fires but this only made the darkness more intense under its shadow and the lead was kept going in order to prevent them from sailing into shallow water by the captain's orders strict silence was observed on board the ship and every eye was strained ahead on the lookout for the pirate vessel presently all became aware of a confused noise apparently coming from the land but at some distance ahead as they got further on distant shouts and cries were heard i fancy the governor said to the captain the band from the town have met the pirates and the latter are retreating to their ship then the ship can't be far off the captain said daylight is beginning to break in the east and we shall soon be able to make her out against the sky that is if she is still lying at anchor on getting round the next point the vessel was distinctly visible the shouting on the shore was now plainly heard and there could be no doubt that a desperate fight was going on there it seemed to be close to the water's edge there is a boat rowing off to the ship one of the sailors said then get out your oars again she is not more than half a mile away and she can hardly get under way before we reach her besides judging from the sound of the fight the pirates must have lost a good many men 
and will not be able to man all the oars even if they gain their ship. The men sat down to their oars with alacrity. Every sailor on board felt it almost as a personal insult that pirates should dare to enter the Venetian waters and carry on their depredations there. The glare of the burning houses, too, had fired their indignation to the utmost, and all were eager for the fight. Three boats were now seen rowing towards the ship. "'Stretch to your oars, men,' the captain said. "'We must be alongside them, if we can, before they can take to their sweeps.' The pirates had now seen them, and Francis, standing at the bow, eagerly watching the vessel, could hear orders shouted to the boats. These pulled rapidly alongside, and he could see the men clambering up in the greatest haste. There was a din of voices. Some men tried to get up the sails, others got out oars, and the utmost confusion evidently prevailed. In obedience to the shouts of the officers, the sails were lowered again, and all betook themselves to the oars, but scarce a stroke had been pulled before the Venetian galley ran up alongside. Grapnels were thrown, and the crew, seizing their weapons, sprang on to the deck of the pirate. The crew of the latter knew that they had no mercy to expect, and although weakened by the loss of nearly a third of their number in the fighting on shore, sprang from their benches and rushed to oppose their assailants with the desperation of despair. They were led by Ruggiero Mocenigo, who, furious at the failure of his schemes, and preferring death to the shame of being carried to Venice as a pirate and a traitor, rushed upon the Venetians with a fury which, at first, carried all before it. Supported by his moors and renegades, he drove back the boarders and almost succeeded in clearing the deck of his vessel. He himself engaged hand to hand with the commander of the Venetian galley, and at the third thrust ran him through the throat, but the Venetians, although they had yielded to the first onslaught, again poured over the bulwarks of the galley. Polani, burning to punish the man who had so repeatedly tried to injure him, accompanied them, Francis keeping close beside him. Ruggiero Mocenigo, traitor and villain, your time has come. Ruggiero started at hearing his name thus proclaimed, for on board his own ship, he was simply known as the captain, but in the dim light he recognized Polani and at once crossed swords with him. Be not so sure, Polani, perhaps it is your time that has come. The two engaged with fury. Polani was still strong and vigorous. His opponent had the advantage of youth and activity, but Polani's weight and strength told, and he was forcing his opponent back when his foot slipped on the blood-stained deck. He fell forward, and in another moment Ruggiero would have run him through the body, had not the weapon been knocked up by Francis, who, watching every movement of the fight, sprang forward when he saw the merchant slip. This time, Ruggiero, my hands are free. How about your vengeance now? Ruggiero gave a cry of astonishment at seeing the lad whom he believed to be lying in chains five hundred miles away facing him for a moment he recoiled and then with the cry i will take it now sprang forward but this time he had met an opponent as active and as capable as himself for a minute or two they fought on even terms and then ruggiero fell suddenly backwards a crossbow bolt from one of the Venetians on the poop of the vessel, having struck him full in the forehead. Without their leader, the spirit of the pirates had fled. They still fought steadily and desperately, but it was only to sell their lives as dearly as possible. And in five minutes after the fall of Ruggiero, the last man was cut down, for no quarter was given to pirates. Just as the combat concluded, the sound of oars was heard, and the other two galleys came up to the assistance of their consort. They arrived too late to take part in the conflict, but cheered lustily when they heard that the pirate captain and all his crew had been killed. Upon learning that the commander of the galley was killed, 
the captain next in seniority assumed the command in a few minutes the bodies of the pirates were thrown overboard the wounded were carried below to have their wounds attended to while the bodies of those who had fallen thirteen in number were laid together on the deck for burial on shore thanks to you francisco that i am not lying there beside them the merchant said i did not know that you were so close at hand and as i slipped i felt that my end had come you were getting the better of him up to that point francis said i was close at hand in readiness to strike in should i see that my aid was wanted but up to the moment you slipped i believe that you would have avenged your wrongs yourself it is well that he fell as he did it would have been dreadful indeed had he been carried to venice to bring shame and disgrace upon a noble family thank god his power for mischief is at an end i have had no peace of mind since the day when you first thwarted his attempt to carry off the girls nor should i have ever had until i obtained sure tidings that he was dead the perseverance with which he has followed his resolve to make my daughter his wife is almost beyond belief had his mind been turned to other matters he was capable of attaining greatness for no obstacle would have barred his way it almost seems as if it were a duel between him and you to the death his aim to injure me and yours to defend us and now it has ended maria will breathe more freely when she hears the news for gay and light-hearted as she is the dread of that man has weighed heavily upon her the governor who from the poop of the vessel had watched the conflict now came up and warmly congratulated francis upon his bravery i saw you rush forward just as my friend polani fell and engage his assailant at first i thought you lost for the villain was counted one of the best swordsmen in venice and you are still but a lad but i saw you did not give way an inch but held your own against him and i believe you would have slain him unaided for you were fighting with greater coolness than he was still i was relieved when i saw him fall for even then the combat was doubtful and his men to do them justice fought like demons how comes it that one so young as you should be so skilled with your weapon this is not the first time that my young friend has done good service to the state polani said for it was he who led a crew of one of my ships to the aid of pisani when his galley was boarded by the genoese at the battle of antium is this he the governor said in surprise i heard of course by the account of those who came from venice a month since how pisani was aided when hard pressed by the crew of one of your ships headed by a young englishman upon whom the state had conferred the rights of citizenship as a recognition of his services but i did not dream that the englishman was but a lad what is your age young sir i am just eighteen francis replied our people are all fond of strong exercise and thus it was that i became more skilled perhaps than many of my age in the use of arms at nine o'clock the squadron arrived in the port bringing with them the captured galley as soon as they were seen approaching the church bells rang flags were hung out from the houses and the whole population assembled at the quay to welcome the victors and to hear the news do you go on at once directly we land francisco and set the girls minds at ease i must come on with the governor and he is sure to be detained and will have much to say before he can make his way through the crowd francis was on his arrival at the governor's recognized by the domestics and at once shown into the room where the girls were awaiting him the fact that the pirate galley had been captured was already known to them the news having been brought some hours before by a horseman from the other side of the island where is our father maria exclaimed as francis entered alone he is well and sent me on to relieve your minds saint mark be praised maria said we have been sorely anxious about you both a messenger who brought the news said that it could be seen from the shore that there was a desperate fight on board the pirate ship which was attacked by one galley only we felt sure that it would be the ship that the governor was in and we knew you were with him 
and our father was so enraged at what had happened that we felt sure he would take part in the fight he did so francis said and himself engaged hand to hand with mochinigo and would probably have killed him had not his foot slipped on the deck i was of course by his side and occupied the villain until a cross-bolt pierced his brain so there is an end to all your trouble with him is he really dead maria said oh francisco how thankful i am he seemed so determined that i began to think he was sure some day to succeed in carrying me off not that i would ever have become his wife for i had vowed to kill myself before that came about i should have thought he might have known that he could never have forced me to be his wife i told him the same thing francis said and he replied that he was not afraid of that for that he should have your sister in his power also and that he should warn you that if you laid hands on yourself he should make her his wife instead of you the girls both gave an exclamation of horror i never thought of that maria said but he would indeed have disarmed me with such a threat it would have been horrible for me to have been the wife of such a man but i think i could have borne it rather than have consigned julia to such a fate oh here is father i have got away sooner than i expected polani said as he entered the governor was good enough to beg me to come on at once to you you have heard all the news i suppose and know that our enemy will persecute you no more we have heard papa and also that you yourself fought with him which was very wrong and very rash of you and did he tell you that had it not been for him i should not be here alive now girls no father he said that when you slipped he occupied ruggiero's attention until the cross-bolt struck him that is what he did my dear but had he not occupied his attention i should have been a dead man the thrust was aimed at me as i fell and would have pierced me had he not sprung forward and turned it aside and then engaged in single combat with mochinigo who with all his faults was brave and a skilful swordsman and yet as the governor himself said probably francisco would have slain him even had not the combat ended as it did and now we must have his story in full i have not heard much about it yet and you have heard nothing and i want to know how he managed to get out of the hands of that man when he had once fallen into them that is what we want to know too father we know what a sharp watch was kept upon us and i am sure they must have been much more severe with him they were certainly more severe francis said smiling for my right hand was chained to my left ankle and the left hand to my right ankle not tightly you know but the chain was so short that i could not stand upright but on the other hand i do not think my guards were as vigilant as yours however i will tell you the whole story the girls listened with rapt attention to the story of the capture the escape and of his hiding in the hold of the pirate in order to be able to give them a warning in time your escape was fortunate indeed the merchant said when he had finished fortunate both for you and for us for i have no doubt that mochinigo had intended to put you to a lingering death on his return as for the girls nothing could have saved them from the fate he designed for them save the method which you took of arriving here before him what are we to do for him father maria exclaimed we are not tired of thanking him but he hates being thanked if he would only get into some terrible scrape julia and i would set out to rescue him at once but you see he gets out of his scrapes before we hear of them it is quite disheartening not to be able to do anything francis laughed merrily it is terrible is it not signora but if i manage to get into any scrape and have time to summon you to my assistance be sure i will do so but you see one cannot get into a scrape when one chooses and i must be content while i am away in knowing that i have the good wishes of you and your sister do not trouble yourself maria her father said some day an opportunity may come for our paying our debts and in the meantime francis is content that we should be his debtors and now what are you going to do papa i shall sail with you for venice tomorrow
the governor will be sending one of the galleys with the news of the capture of the pirate and doubtless he will give us all a passage in her i shall order steps to be taken at once for rebuilding the villa and will get it completed by the spring before which time you will be off my hands young lady and i shall not be altogether sorry for you have been a very troublesome child lately it has not been my fault maria pouted not at all my dear it has been your misfortune and i am not blaming you at all but the trouble is now over father so much the better for rufino the merchant said it will be good news to him that you are freed from the persecution of ruggiero and now i must leave you for i have arranged to ride over with the governor to the other side of the island he has to investigate the damage which took place last evening i hear that upwards of a score of villas were sacked and destroyed and that many persons were killed and while he is doing that i shall see what has to be done at our place i don't know whether the walls are standing or whether it will have to be entirely rebuilt and i must arrange with some builder to go over from here with me and take my instructions as to what must be done on the following day the party set sail for venice where they arrived without adventure preparations were at once begun for the marriage of maria with rufino giustiniani and six weeks later the wedding ceremony took place francis did not go to sea until this was over for when he spoke of a fresh voyage a short time after their return maria declared that she would not be married unless he remained to be present you have got me out of all my scrapes hitherto francisco and you must see me safely through this as signor polani also declared that it was not to be thought of that francis should leave until after the marriage he was obliged to remain for it he was glad however when it was over for he found the time on shore more tedious than usual the girls were taken up with the preparations for the ceremony and visitors were constantly coming and going and the house was not like itself but even when the marriage was over he was forced to remain some time longer in venice the genoese fleets were keeping the sea and pisani had not since the battle of antium succeeded in coming up with them the consequence was that commerce was at a standstill for the risk of capture was so great that the merchants ceased to send their ships to sea the prophet would not repay us for the risk francisco the merchant said one day when they were talking over it if only one cargo in ten fell into their hands the profit off the other nine would be swept away but as i see that you are longing to be afloat again you can if you like join one of the state galleys which start next week to reinforce pisani's fleet the last time pisani wrote to me he said how glad he should be to have you with him and after your service at antium i have no doubt whatever that i could procure for you a post as second in command in one of the ships what do you say i should certainly like it signor greatly but as you said before it would be a mere waste of time for me to take service with the state when i am determined upon the vocation of a merchant i did say that francis and meant it at the time but at present trade is as you see at a standstill so you would not be losing time and in the next place it is always an advantage even to a trader to stand well with the state here in venice all the great merchants are of noble family and trade is no bar to occupying the highest offices of the state many of our doges have been merchants while merchants are often soldiers diplomatists or governors as the state requires their services you have already you see obtained considerable benefit by the action at antium i do not say that you would derive any direct benefit even were you to distinguish yourself again as highly as on that occasion still it is always well to gain the consideration of your fellows and to be popular with the people therefore if you would like to take service with the state until this affair is decided with genoa and the seas are again open to our ships i think it will be advantageous to you rather than not then with your permission i will certainly do so signor francis said of course i should prefer to go as an officer on board one of the ships but if not i will go as a volunteer you need not fear about that francis with my influence and that of the giustiniani and the repute you have gained for yourself 
you may be sure of an appointment. Rufino would have commanded one of the ships had it not been for his marriage. Rufino Giustiniani had indeed been most warm in his expressions of gratitude to Francis, to whom the whole family had shown the greatest attention, giving him many presents as a proof of their good will and gratitude. I am quite jealous of your English friend, Rufino had said one day to Maria. I do believe, Maria, that you care for him more than you do for me. It is lucky for me that he is not two or three years older. Maria laughed. I do care for him dearly, and if he had been, as you say, older, and had fallen in love with me, I can't say how it would have been. You must acknowledge it would be very hard to say no to a man who keeps on saving you from frightful peril. But then, you see, a girl can't fall in love with a man who does not fall in love with her. Francisco is so different from us Venetians. He always says just what he thinks, and never pays anyone even the least bit of a compliment. How can you fall in love with a man like that? Of course you can love him like a brother, and I do love Francisco as if he were my brother, but I don't think we should have got further than that if he had been ever so old. And does Francis never pay you compliments, Julia? Never, Julia said decidedly. It would be hateful of him if he did. But Maria doesn't object to compliments, Julia. She looks for them as if they were her daily bread. Don't you, Maria? You will have to learn to put up with them soon, Julia, for you will be out in society now, and the young men will crowd round your chair, just as they have done round that of this little flirt, your sister. I shall have to put up with it, I suppose, Julia said quietly, just as one puts up with other annoyances. But I should certainly never get to care for anyone who thinks so little of me, as to believe that I could be pleased by being addressed in such terms. From which I gather, Giustiniani said, smiling, that this English lad's bluntness of speech pleases you more than it does Maria? It pleases Maria, too, Julia said, though she may choose to say that it doesn't, and I don't think it quite right to discuss him at all, when we all owe him as much as we do. Giustiniani glanced at Maria and gave a little significant nod. I do not think Julia regards Francisco in quite the brotherly way that you do, Maria, he whispered presently to her. Perhaps not, Maria answered. You see, she had not fallen in love with you before she met him. But I do not know. Julia seldom speaks of him when we are alone. And if she did, you don't suppose I should tell you my sister's secrets, sir? The day after his conversation with Francis, Polani handed him his nomination as second in command of the Pluto, which he had obtained that morning from the Signori. You'll be glad to hear that it is in this ship that Matteo also sails, for Matteo had come home for his brother's wedding. I am very glad of that, Francis said. I wish that poor Giuseppe was also here to go with me. I shall miss him terribly. He was a most faithful and devoted follower. I have already sent orders to my agent in Tunis to spare no pains in discovering to whom the crew of the Naxos were sold. It is unfortunate that so many other captives were sold at the same time, as it will make it so much more difficult to trace our men. Those purchasing are not likely to know more than their first names, and may not even take the trouble to find out those, but may give them the first appellation that comes to hand. Therefore, he has to find out who are now the masters of the whole of the captives sold at the same time, and then to pursue his investigations until he discovers the identity of the men he is looking for. Once he has found this, I will promise you there will be no delay. I have ordered him to make the best bargain in each case he can, but that, at any rate, he is to buy every one of them whatever it may cost." I have sent him the personal descriptions of each man of the boat's crew, as given to me by their friends and relatives here, as this will be an assistance in his search. If, for instance, he hears of a Christian slave named Giuseppe living with a master some hundreds of miles in the interior, the fact that this man is middle-aged will show at once that he was not the Giuseppe, aged twenty, of whom he is in search. I have particularly impressed upon him in my letter that we were especially anxious for the rescue of the captain and the young man Giuseppe. So I hope that by the time you return from the voyage, 
I may have received some news of them. Matteo was greatly pleased when he heard that he was going to sail under Francis. I would rather that we had both been volunteers, Francis said. It seems absurd my being appointed second officer, while you as yet have no official position. I am not in the least bit in the world jealous, Francisco. With the exception of taking part in the fight at Antium, I have had no experience whatever, while you have been going through all sorts of adventures for the last two years, and always have come out of them marvelously well. An hour after Matteo left him, a retainer of the family brought Francis a letter from Signor Giustiniani, inviting him to come to his house that evening, as many of Matteo's comrades on board the Pluto would be present. On Francis going to the palace, he found assembled not only the young men who would be Matteo's comrades as volunteers, but also the captain and other officers of the ship, and to them Signor Giustiniani personally presented Francis, while Rufino and Matteo did all they could to ensure the heartiest welcome for him, by telling everyone how greatly they were indebted to him, and how gallantly he had behaved on several occasions. Many of the young men he already knew as Matteo's friends, and by them he was received with the greatest cordiality. But his reception by the captain, and one or two of the other officers, was much more cool. The captain, whose name was Carlo Bottini, was a distant connection of the Mocenigo family, and was therefore already prejudiced against Francis. The coolness of the other officers was due to the fact that Francis, a foreigner and several years junior to themselves, had been placed in command over their heads. End of chapter 14 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 15 of The Lion of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century, by G. A. Henty. Chapter 15 The Battle of Pola. The squadron, consisting of four galleys, sailed for Cyprus where Pisani had just endeavoured without success to expel the Genoese from Famagosta. It was towards the end of August that they effected a junction with his fleet. Pisani received Francis with great warmth, and in the presence of many officers, remarked that he was glad to see that the Republic was, at last, appointing men for their merits, and not, as heretofore, allowing family connection and influence to be the chief passport to their favour. For two months the fleet sailed among the islands of the Levant and along the shores of Greece, Istria, and Dalmatia, hoping to find the Genoese fleet, but altogether without success. In November, when they were on the coast of Istria, winter set in with extraordinary severity, and the frost was intense. Pisani wrote to his government asking permission to bring the fleet into Venice until the spring. The signori, however, refused his request, for they feared that, were it known that their fleet had come into port for the winter, the Genoese would take advantage of its absence to seize upon some of the islands belonging to Venice, and to induce the inhabitants of the cities of Istria and Dalmatia, always ready for revolt, to declare against her. The first indications of the winter were more than verified. The cold was altogether extraordinary and out of the nineteen galleys of Pisani, only six were fit to take the sea, with their full complement of men, when the spring of 1379 began. Many of the vessels had been disabled by storms. Numbers of the men had died, more had been sent home invalided, and it was only by transferring the men from the other vessels to the six in the best condition that the crews of the latter were made up to their full strength. As soon as the terrible frost broke, Pisani received a reinforcement of twelve ships from Venice, these being, for the most part, built and equipped at the cost of his personal friends, Polani having contributed two of the number. With the eighteen sail, 
Pisani put to sea to prosecute a fresh search for the Genoese admiral Doria and his fleet. The Pluto was one of the six vessels which remained in good condition at the end of the winter, thanks in no small degree to the energy and care which Francis had bestowed in looking after the welfare of the crew. In the most bitter weather, he had himself landed with the boats to see that firewood was cut and brought off in abundance not only for the officers cabins but to warm that portion of the ship inhabited by the men knowing that polani would not grudge any sum which might be required he obtained from his agents ample supplies of warm clothing and bedding for the men occupying himself incessantly for their welfare while the captain and other officers passed their time in their warm and comfortable cabins francis induced matteo and several of his comrades to brave the weather as he did and to exert themselves for the benefit of the men and the consequence was that while but few of the other ships retained enough men to raise their sails in case of emergency the strength of the crew of the pluto was scarcely impaired at the termination of the winter the admiral on paying a visit of inspection to the ship was greatly struck with the contrast which the appearance of the crew afforded to that of the other galleys and warmly complimented the commander on the condition of his men the captain received the praise as if it was entirely due to himself and said not a single word of the share which francis had had in bringing it about matteo was most indignant at this injustice towards his friend and managed that through a relative serving in the admiral's own ship a true report of the case should come to pisani's ears francis was in no way troubled at the captain's appropriation of the praise due to himself there had not from the time he sailed been any cordiality between francis and the other officers these had been selected for the position solely from family influence and none of them were acquainted with the working of a ship in those days not only in venice but in other countries naval battles were fought by soldiers rather than sailors nobles and knights with their retainers embarked on board a ship for the purpose of fighting and of fighting only the management of the vessel being carried on entirely by sailors under their own officers thus neither the commander of the force on board the galley nor any of his officers with the exception of francis knew anything whatever about the management of the ship nor were capable of giving orders to the crew among the latter were some who had sailed with francis in his first two voyages and these gave so excellent a report of him to the rest that they were from the first ready to obey his orders as promptly as those of their own sub-officer francis concerned himself but little with the ill-will that was shown him by the officers he knew that it arose from jealousy not only of the promotion he a foreigner and a junior in years had received over them but of the fact that he had already received the thanks of the republic for the services he had rendered and stood high in the favor of the admiral who never lost an opportunity of showing the interest he had in him had the hostility shown itself in any offensive degree francis would at once have resented it but matteo and some of those on board who had been his comrades in the fencing rooms had given such reports of his powers with his weapons that even those most opposed to him thought it prudent to observe a demeanor of outward politeness towards him for three months the search for the genoese fleet was ineffectual a trip had been made along the coast of apulia and the fleet had returned to pola with a large convoy of merchant ships loaded with grain when on the seventh of may doria appeared off the port with twenty-five sail but pisani was now by no means anxious to fight zeno was away with a portion of the fleet and although he had received reinforcements he numbered but twenty-one vessels and a number of his men were laid up with sickness the admiral however was not free to follow out the dictates of his own opinions the venetians had a mischievous habit which was afterwards adopted by the french republic of fettering their commanders by sea and land by appointing civilian commissioners or as they were termed in venice proveditors who had power to overrule the nominal commander 
when therefore pisani assembled a council of war and informed them of his reasons for wishing to remain on the defensive until the return of zeno he was overruled by the proveditors who not only announced themselves unanimously in favor of battle but sneered at pisani's prudence as being the result of cowardice pisani in his indignation drew his sword and would have attacked the proveditors on the spot had he not been restrained by his captains however the council decided upon instant battle and pisani was forced by the rules of the service at once to carry their decision into effect ascending the poop of his galley he addressed in a loud voice the crews of the ships gathered around him remember my brethren that those who will now face you are the same whom you vanquished with so much glory on the roman shore do not let the name of luciano doria terrify you it is not the names of the commanders that will decide the conflict but venetian hearts and venetian hands let him that loves saint mark follow me the men received the address with a shout and as soon as the commanders had regained their galleys the fleet moved out to attack the enemy the fight was a furious one each vessel singling out an opponent and engaging her hand to hand carlo bottini was killed early in the fight and francis succeeded to the command his galley had grappled with one of the largest of the genoese vessels and a desperate conflict went on sometimes the venetians gained a footing on the deck of the genoese sometimes they were driven back and the genoese in turn poured on board but no decisive advantage was gained on either side after an hour's fighting the genoese crew was numerically much stronger than that of the pluto and although francis with matteo and his comrades headed their men and cheered them on they could make no impression on the ranks of the enemy suddenly the genoese threw off the grapnels that attached the two ships and hoisting their sails sheared off francis looked round to see the cause of this sudden manoeuvre and perceived for the first time that the genoese vessels were all in flight with the venetians pressing closely upon them sails were at once hoisted and the pluto joined in the chase but the flight was a feigned one and it was only designed to throw the venetian rank into confusion after sailing for two miles the genoese suddenly turned and fell upon their pursuers as they came up in straggling order the result was decisive many of the venetian ships were captured before the rest came up to take part in the battle others were hemmed in by numerous foes pisani after fighting until he saw that all was lost made the signal for the ships to withdraw from the conflict and he himself with six galleys succeeded in fighting his way through the enemy's fleet and gained a refuge in the port of parenzo all the rest were taken from seven to eight hundred venetians perished in the fight two thousand four hundred were taken prisoners twelve commanders were killed and five captured the genoese losses were also severe and doria himself was among the slain having been killed by a spear thrust by donato zeno commander of one of the galleys almost at the moment of victory the pluto had defended herself for a long time against the attacks of three of the genoese galleys and had repeatedly endeavored to force her way out of the throng but the genoese held her fast with their grapnels and at last the greater part of her crew were driven down below and francis seeing the uselessness of further resistance ordered the little group who were now completely pent in by the genoese to lower their weapons all were more or less severely wounded and were bleeding from sword cuts and thrusts this is an evil day for venice matteo said as having been deprived of their weapons the prisoners were thrust below i heard the genoese say that only six of our galleys have escaped all the rest have been taken we were the last ship to surrender that's a comfort anyhow now matteo before you do anything else let me bind up your wounds you are bleeding in two or three places 
and you are bleeding from something like a dozen francisco so you had better let me play the doctor first the captain is always served last so do as you are told and strip off your doublet now gentlemen he said turning to the other officers let each of us do what we can to dress the wounds of others we can expect no care from the genoese leeches who will have their hands full for a long time to come with their own men there are some among us who will soon bleed to death unless their wounds are staunched let us therefore take the most serious cases first and so on in rotation until all have been attended to it was fortunate for them that in the hold in which they were confined there were some casks of water for for hours the genoese paid no attention whatever to their prisoners and the wounded were beginning to suffer agonies of thirst when the barrels were fortunately discovered the head of one was knocked in and some shallow tubs used for serving the water to the crew filled and the men knelt down and drank by turns from these many were too enfeebled by their wounds to rise and their thirst was assuaged by dipping articles of clothing into the water and letting the fluid from these run into their mouths it was not until next morning that the prisoners were ordered to come on deck many had died during the night others were too weak to obey the summons the names of the rest were taken and not a little surprise was expressed by the genoese officers at the extreme youth of the officer in command of the pluto i was only the second in command francis said in answer to their questions carlo bottini was in command of the ship but he was killed at the commencement of the fight but how is it that one so young came to be second you must belong to some great family to have been thus pushed forward above men so much your senior it was a wise choice nevertheless the commander of one of the galleys which had been engaged with the pluto said for it is but justice to own that no ship was better handled or fought in the venetian fleet they were engaged with us first and for over an hour they fought us on fair terms yielding no foot of ground although we had far more men than they carried i noticed this youth fighting always in the front line with the venetians and marvelled at the strength and dexterity with which he used his weapons and afterwards when there were three of us around him he fought like a boar surrounded by hounds i am sure he is a brave youth and well worthy the position he held to whatsoever he owed it i belong to no noble family of venice francis said my name is francis hammond and my parents are english you are not a mercenary i trust the genoese captain asked earnestly i am not francis replied i am a citizen of venice and my name is inscribed in her books as my comrades will vouch right glad am i that it is so the genoese said for pietro doria who is now by the death of his brother in chief command has ordered that every mercenary found among the prisoners shall today be slain it is a brutal order francis said fearlessly whosoever may have given it a mercenary taken in fair fight has as much right to be held for ransom or fair exchange as any other prisoner and if your admiral thus breaks the laws of war there is not a free lance from one end of italy to the other but will take it up as a personal quarrel the genoese frowned at the boldness with which francis spoke but at heart agreed in the sentiments he expressed for among the genoese officers generally there was a feeling that this brutal execution in cold blood was an impolitic as well as a disgraceful deed the officers were now placed in the forehold of the ship the crew being confined in the afterhold soon afterwards they knew by the motion of the vessel that sail had been put on her so we are on our way to a genoese prison francisco matteo said we had a narrow escape of it before but this time i suppose it is our fate there is certainly no hope of rescue matteo it is too early as yet to say whether there is any hope of escape the prospect looked darker when i was in the hands of ruggiero but i managed to get away then i was alone and closely guarded now we have in the ship well nigh two hundred friends prisoners like ourselves it is true but still to be counted on then too 
the genoese are no doubt so elated with their triumph that they are hardly likely to keep a very vigilant guard over us altogether i should say that the chances are in our favor were i sure that the pluto is sailing alone i should be very confident that we might retake her but probably the fifteen captured ships are sailing in company and would at once come to the aid of their comrades here directly they saw any signs of a conflict going on and we could hardly hope to recapture the ship without making some noise over it i should think not matteo agreed then again matteo even if we find it impossible to get at the crew and with them to recapture the ship some chance may occur by which you and i may manage to make our escape if you say so francisco i at once believe it you got us all out of the scrape down at girgenti you got polani's daughters out of a worse scrape when they were captives on san nicolo and got yourself out of the worst scrape of all when you escaped from the grip of ruggiero mocenigo therefore when you say that there is a fair chance of escape out of this business i look upon it as almost as good as done it is a long way from that matteo francis laughed still i hope we may manage it somehow i have the greatest horror of a genoese prison for it is notorious that they treat their prisoners of war shamefully and i certainly do not mean to enter one if there is the slightest chance of avoiding it but for to-day matteo i shall not even begin to think about it in the first place my head aches with the various thumps it has had in the second i feel weak from loss of blood and in the third my wounds smart most amazingly so do mine matteo agreed in addition i am hungry for the bread they gave us this morning was not fit for dogs although i had to eat it as it was that or nothing and now matteo i shall try to get a few hours sleep i did not close my eyes last night from the pain of my wounds but i think i might manage to drop off now the motion of the vessel aided the effect of the bodily weakness that francis was feeling and in spite of the pain of his wounds he soon went off into a sound sleep once or twice he woke but hearing no voices or movement he supposed his companions were all asleep and again went off until a stream of light coming in from the opening of the hatchway thoroughly roused him matteo who was lying by his side also woke and stretched himself and there was a general movement among the ten young men who were their comrades in misfortune here is your breakfast a voice from above the hatchway said and a basket containing bread and a bucket of water was lowered by ropes breakfast matteo said why it is not two hours since we breakfasted last i suspect it is twenty-two matteo we have had a very long sleep and i feel all the better of it now let us divide the liberal breakfast our captors have given us fortunately there is just enough light coming down from those scuttles to enable us to do so fairly there was a general laugh from his comrades at the cheerful way in which francis spoke only one of them had been an officer on the pluto the rest were like matteo volunteers of good families there was a good deal of light-hearted jesting over their meal when it was over francis said now let us hold a council of war you are better off than pisani was anyhow one of the young men said for you are not hampered with pro editors and anything that your captaincy may suggest will you may be sure receive our assent i am your captain no longer francis replied we are all prisoners now and equal and each one has a free voice and a free vote then i give my voice and vote at once francisco matteo said to the proposal that you remain our captain and that we obey you as cheerfully and willingly as we should if you were on the poop of the pluto instead of being in the hold in the first place at carlo's death you became our captain by right so long as we remain together and in the second place you have more experience than all of us put together and a very much better head than most of us myself included therefore comrades i vote that messer francisco hammond be still regarded as our captain and obeyed as such there was a general chorus of assent for the energy which francis had displayed throughout the trying winter and the manner in which he had led the crew during the desperate fighting had won for him the regard and the respect of them all 
very well then francis said if you wish it so i will remain your leader but we will nevertheless hold our council of war the question which i shall first present to your consideration is which is the best way to set about retaking the pluto there was a burst of laughter among the young men the matter-of-fact way in which francis proposed what seemed to them an impossibility amused them immensely i am quite in earnest francis went on when the laughter had subsided if it is possibly to be done i mean to retake the pluto and i have very little doubt that it is possible if we set about it in the right way in the first place we may take it as absolutely certain that we very considerably outnumber the genoese on board they must have suffered in the battle almost as much as we did and have had nearly as many killed and wounded in the second place if doria intends to profit by his victory he must have retained a fair amount of fighting men on board each of his galleys and weakened as his force was by the losses of the action he can spare but a comparatively small force on board each of the fifteen captured galleys i should think it probable that there are not more than fifty men in charge of the pluto and we number fully three times that force the mere fact that they let down our food to us by ropes instead of bringing it down showed a consciousness of weakness what you say is quite true paolo parucchi the other officer of the pluto said but they are fifty well-armed men and we are a hundred and fifty without arms and shut down in the hold to which must be added the fact that we are cut off from our men and our men from us they are as it were without a head to plan while we are without arms to strike a murmur of approval was heard among some of the young men i do not suppose that there are no difficulties in our way francis said quietly or that we have only next time the hatch is opened to say to those above gentlemen of genoa we are more numerous than you are and we therefore request you to change places with us immediately all i have asserted so far is that we are sufficiently strong to retake the ship if we get the opportunity what we have now to settle is how that opportunity is to come about to begin with has any one a dagger or knife which has escaped the eye of our searchers no one replied i was afraid that nothing had escaped the vigilance of those who appropriated our belongings as however we have no weapons or tools the next thing is to see what there is in the hold which can be turned to account it is fortunate we are on board the pluto instead of being transferred to another ship as we already know all about her there are some iron bolts driven in along a beam at the farther end they have been used i suppose at some time or other for hanging the carcasses of animals from let us see whether there is any chance of getting some of them out the iron pegs however were so firmly driven into the beam that all their efforts failed to move them in the slightest we will give that up for the present francis said and look round for something more available but with the exception of the water casks the closest search failed to find anything in the hold i do not know whether the iron hoops of a cask would be of any use matteo said certainly they would be of use if we get them off matteo there is no difficulty about that one of the others said examining the casks closely this is an empty one and the hoops seem quite loose in a few minutes four iron hoops were taken off the cask after all matteo said they cannot be of much use the iron is rust-eaten and they would break in our hands before going into any one they would certainly be useless as daggers matteo but i think that with care they will act as saws break off a length of about a foot now straighten it and tear a piece off your doublet and wrap it round and round one end so that you can hold it now just try it on the edge of a beam it certainly cuts matteo announced after a trial but not very fast so that it cuts at all we may be very well content francis said cheerfully we have got a week at least to work in and if the wind is not favorable we may have a month let us therefore break the hoops up into pieces of the right length we must use them carefully for we may expect to have many breakages what next captain our object will of course 
be to cut through into the main hold which separates us from the crew there we shall probably find plenty of weapons but to use our saws we must first find a hole in the bulkhead first of all then let there be a strict search made for a knot hole or any other hole through the bulkhead it was too dark for eyes to be of much use but hands were run all over the bulkhead but no hole however small was discovered it is clear then francis said that the first thing to do is to cut out some of those iron bolts pick out those that are nearest to the lower side of the beam say three of them there are twelve of us that will give four to each bolt and we can relieve each other every few minutes remember it is patience that is required and not strength the work was at once begun the young men had by this time fully entered into the spirit of the attempt the quiet and business-like way in which their leader set about it convinced them that he at least had a firm belief that the work was possible and there was a hope even if but a remote one of avoiding the dreaded dungeons of genoa the work was slow and two or three of the strips of iron were at first broken by the too great eagerness of their holders but when it was found that by using them lightly the edges gradually cut their way into the wood the work went on regularly the pluto had been hurriedly constructed and any timbers that were available in the emergency were utilized consequently much soft wood that at other times would never have been found in the state dockyards was put into her the beam at which they were working was of soft timber and a fine dust fell steadily as the rough iron was sawed backward and forward upon it two cuts were made under each bolt wide at the base and converging towards it the saws were kept going the whole day and although the progress was slow it was fast enough to encourage them and just as the light that came through the scuttle faded away three of the young men hung their weight upon one of the bolts and the wood beneath it already almost severed gave and a suppressed cry of satisfaction announced that one bolt was free the pieces of iron were two feet long and were intended for some other purpose but had been driven in when on loading the ship some strong pegs on which to hang carcasses were required they were driven about three inches into the beam and could have been cut out with an ordinary saw in two or three minutes try the others francis said as many of you get hold of them as can put your hands on the effort was made and the other two bolts were got out they had been roughly sharpened at the end and were fully an inch across they do not make bad weapons matteo said it is not as weapons that we want them matteo they will be more useful to us than any weapons except indeed a good axe we shall want at least three more therefore i propose that we continue our work at once we will divide into watches now it will be twelve hours before we get our allowance of bread again therefore that will give three hours work and nine hours sleep to each they will be just setting the first watch on deck and as we shall hear them changed it will give us a good idea how the time is passing i am ready to work all night myself matteo said at first i had not much faith in what we were doing but now that we have got three of these irons out i am ready to go on working until i drop you will find matteo that your arms will ache so that you cannot hold them up before the end of the three hours sawing like that with your arms above your head is most fatiguing and even the short spells of work we have been having made my arms ache however each must do as much as he can in his three hours and as we are working in the dark we must work slowly and carefully or we shall break our tools fortunately we can get more hoops off now if we want them matteo said with these irons we can wrench them off the sound casks if necessary yes i did not think of that matteo you see we are already getting a stock of tools another thing is with the point of the irons we have got off we can wrench the wood out as fast as we saw it and the saws will not work so stiffly as they did before but we must not do that till the morning for any sound like the breaking of wood might be heard by the watch when everything is quiet although all worked their best they made but slight progress in the dark 
and each worker was forced to take frequent rests for the fatigue of working with their arms above their heads was excessive as soon however as the light began to steal down and the movement above head told them that the crew were at work washing the decks the points of the irons were used to wrench away the wood between the saw cuts and the work then proceeded briskly as they relieved each other every few minutes at last to their intense satisfaction three more irons were got out if anyone had told me one of the party said that a man's arms could hurt as much as mine do from working a few hours i should have disbelieved him there was a chorus of assent for none were accustomed to hard manual labor and the pain in their arms was excessive let us have half an hour's rest francis before you issue your next orders i shall want that at least before i feel that i have any power in my arms at all we will have an hour's rest matteo if you like before that time they will be sending us down our food and after we have breakfasted we can set to work again breakfast one of the young men groaned i cannot call that black bread and water breakfast when i think of the breakfasts i have eaten when i think of the dishes i have refused to eat because they were not cooked to perfection i groan over my folly in those days and my enormous stupidity in ever volunteering to come to sea i should recommend you all francis said to spend the next hour in rubbing and squeezing the muscles of your neighbors arms and shoulders it is the best way for taking out stiffness and giuseppe used to give me relief that way when i was stiff with fencing the idea was adopted and while the rest were at work in the manner he suggested francis taking one of the irons went to the bulkhead one by one he tried the planks from the floorboards to the beams above well captain what is your report matteo asked as he joined the rest my report is a most favorable one francis said by great good luck the planks are nailed from the other side against the beams both above and below what difference does that make francisco all the difference in the world had they been nailed on this side there would have been nothing for it but to carry out our original plan that is to make holes through the planks with these irons large enough for the saws to go through and then to saw the wood out from hole to hole as it is i believe that with five minutes work we could wrench a plank away we have only to push the points of the irons up between the beams and the planks and use them as levers the nails will be strong indeed if those irons with two of us at each would not wrench them out the young men all leapt to their feet pains and aches quite forgotten in the excitement of this unexpected news and six of them seized hold of the irons gently francis said you must remember there may be people going down there at present getting up stores before we venture to disturb a plank we must make the hole sufficiently large for us to spy through this will be a very easy affair in comparison with making a hole large enough for a saw to go through still you will find it will take some time however we had better wait as we agreed till we have had our food End of chapter 15 Recording by Linda Johnson